ancient Japan and Yonaguni Monument. The Yonaguni Pyramid sank into the ocean at the end of the last ice age, around 10,000 years ago. In Okinawan folklore, there are tales of traditional gods in a land of the gods called Nirai Kanai, an unknown faraway land from where happiness is brought. The Yonaguni Monument may have been built to serve a similar deity. Japanese scientists have documented marks on the stones that indicate that they were hewn. Not only that, the tools used in this process have been found in the area and carvings have been discovered. Professor Kimura's unequivocal conclusion based on the scientific evidence is that the monument is man-made and that it was hewn out of the bedrock when it still stood above sea level, perhaps as much as 10,000 years ago. The principal arguments that he puts forward in favor of human intervention are on the record and include the following. Traces of marks that show that human beings worked the stone. There are holes made by wedge-like tools called kasabe in many locations. Around the outside of the loop road, a stone paved pathway connecting principal areas of the main monument, there is a row of neatly stacked rocks as a stone wall, each rock about twice the size of a person in a straight line. There are traces carved along the roadway that humans conducted some form of repairs. The structure is continuous from under the water to the land, and evidence of the use of fire is present. Stone tools are among the artifacts found underwater and on land. Stone tablets with carving that appears to be letters or symbols, such as what we know as the plus mark and a V-shape, were retrieved from under the water. From the waters nearby, stone tools have been retrieved. Two are for known purposes that we can recognize, the majority are not. At the bottom of the sea, a relief carving of an animal figure was discovered on a huge stone. On the higher surfaces of the structure, there are several areas which slope quite steeply down towards the south. Kimura points out that deep symmetrical trenches appear on the northern elevations of these areas which could not have been formed by any known natural processes. A series of steps rises at regular intervals up the south face of the monument from the pathway at its base, 27 meters underwater, towards its summit, less than 6 meters below the waves. A similar stairway is found on the monument's northern face, blocks that must necessarily have been removed in order to form the monument's impressive terraces are not found lying in places where they would have fallen if only gravity and natural forces were operating. Instead, they seem to have been artificially cleared away to one side, and in some cases, are absent from the site entirely. The effects of this unnatural and selective cleanup operation are partially evident on the rock-cut pathway. Kamura calls it the loop road that winds around the western and southern faces of the base of the monument. It passes directly beneath the main terraces, yet is completely clear of the mass of rubble that would have had to have been removed in order for the terraces to form at all. Be about 11. Loved swimming. Swimming at beach with shark nets. They've got these beacons up on the shore that tell you where it's safe to swim and you have to stay in between them. I've often seen the lifeguards come down from the tower and make a loud bleep on their loudspeaker and usher people back into the safety zone if they swim out too far, left or right, and parents always tell me to stay in the safe zone. Decide today, I am going to swim straight out until I find the shark nets, but tell myself I will stay between them and the shore when I find them. Swim out far beyond the kids, and then the adults, and then beyond the more adventurous adults, and still have not found the shark nets. Expect to see some half-submerged boys somewhere along the line. Suddenly, I see them pass under me, but the water is getting choppy, and I am pulled straight over them. Totally alone now, a good half-mile or so from the shore. Glance back to shore. I am way out beyond the one beacon, by a good quarter of a mile. There was no bloop from the lifeguards, and I can see the area of beach where everyone is, between the beacons, is quiet. No one is hailing me, nothing. Strange feeling. Start getting picked up by undertows and getting pulled further and further along parallel to the beach. Start getting submerged over and over. Swimming against the currents is useless. 
get it into my head a few times, when pushed under, that I won't make it back up this time. Also have sharks on my mind. Suddenly I start feeling shells, rocks under my knees, and feet when I'm pushed under. Notice that I'm close to shore. Finally can get my feet under me, and come up on shore. I'm way up the coastline. It's not even beach anymore, but a stone shoreline. Make my way down the shoreline, until I get back to the beach. My parents were still sleeping on their towels. The lifeguards had not even noticed, and I was actually in real trouble out there. Never said anything about it to anyone, but it was kind of foundational in a way. Damn, I have a similar story, which happened about four months ago. I suck at green tax, but... Fly down country to visit GF, who I haven't seen for a while. Chilling and stuff. Oh, and on. We should go kayaking at the river. Never been kayaking in my life, or had much experience in the water. Shitty childhood, or whatever. Her stepdad hires some kayaks the next day, and we make our way out. It's like a little secluded swimming hole that only her family really goes to, but runs down and around the whole area. Nothing but trees and dirt roads surrounding the river. I have to drag the damn things about a mile before we actually get to the water. Listen to music and drink and stuff there for a little while until we decide we want to start. Put our stuff in the little compartment thing where you put stuff. Cruise downstream about a half mile. Okay, watch out. There's a rapid coming up. Okay. No idea what the hell a rapid is. See big swells in the water with a strong ass current pulling me straight towards the willow trees hanging over the bank. Wait, what the hell? Get pulled straight into the tree and hit my head on an overhanging branch. Flip. Notice that I strap myself into my kayak subconsciously. Struggle to flip myself while getting pulled by the strong ass current. Submerged underwater for time frames of 5 to 10 seconds for about 2 minutes straight. Finally get my shit together and think more calmly. Am I calm or am I just becoming unconscious? Get lightheaded as I pop up and take a big breath. Go down and unstrap myself. Fiddle around with the belt until I get it loose and literally just as I get to the surface, my skin feels like it's about to burst. Pull myself out onto the upside down kayak and lay there and I think I black out for a while. Water starts calming down and as I come back to, my girlfriend is crying and trying to come back but the current is still too strong to paddle against so we have to wait for a bit. Water calms, pull kayaks onto rocks, get back onto shore. Screw kayaking man. In Death Valley National Park, Devil's Hole is a tiny spot of water in an otherwise desolate and inhospitable environment. It is home to the only population of the Devil's Hole pupfish which lives in the top few feet of this pool of water. They are rarely found more than 2-3 to three feet from the surface, but the maximum depth is over 300 feet. One night in 1965, several kids jumped the fence and got in. Two never came back out, although divers attempted to rescue them in the event that they were stuck in an air pocket called Brown's Room. They were not. Nobody knows precisely how deep Devil's Hole is. Tethered weights go to at least 485 feet with more to go. David Rose and Paul Jan Tontiri entered with friends, but never came back out. Jim Houts reconnoitred to a depth of 315 feet, then a record but found no bodies, only a dive chart and a fading flashlight. Houts discusses the recovery attempt. I also led a rescue there in 1965. Three went into the water, and one got some sense and said, I'm not doing it. They did this at night. Once you round that first bend at 90 feet, you don't know what dark is until you go around that bend. There is no reflection down there. The walls are limestone. They look smooth like clouds, but they're rough. Rub your hands against it, and it'll take the skin right off. A call came in from the federal government. They said, are there any air pockets in those caves down there? And I said, yeah. I get up to Los Alamitos with my guys in the seaplane. A groom and albatross was on the runway, engines running. Next thing you know, we were flying, and the hatch is not even closed. So we get there from Nellis Air Force Base at daybreak. The media was out in full force. The military, state police, even a big trailer that served food. We had four guys. 
I set up my first team of two guys, and we went in increments, with divers at two junctions, to handle decompression issues. I get down into the lower chamber, and there I found a mask, with a snorkel on it, and a fin. Later I found another item, from the other diver. But the point is, when you get that deep, you get nitrogen narcosis. Nitrogen poisoning. It's a drunken state, and you get lightheaded. Once you get that, it is far more probable that you are going to do something stupid, because you feel that there is nothing you can't do. The only reason I was able to make these dives was because I had been training for it, or the narcosis. I went to the surface and notified everybody about what we found. It was a very sad, very solemn moment. I said, I'm going to recover the rest of this equipment, and I will do one more thing to confirm. So I made one dive to the last little ledge at 325 feet. At that point, the devil's hole opens up wide, and I can tell you one thing. I know it goes down to over 900 feet. We once let out 932 feet of cable from that point, and there is a current down there. So how much of the cable was bowed from the current, I don't know. But it's just, it's just massive. But down at 325 feet, that is where I found the remainder of some of the gear. Right there. Just as big as life. I am sure that's where the kid wound up, in the very far depths. He just kept going down. The guys were never found. The only thing down there now is bones. There is always that Missouri cave diving story they tell to keep us straight. Local dive shop takes trip to go cave diving. They choose to dive with nitrox, aka enriched air. Gas mixture that allows you to essentially dive longer, but keeps you from diving deeper. Team submerges. Time goes by as they are barely for a cave entrance. One of the divers notices their buddy goes belly up to cavern roof goes to investigate. Oxygen levels are fine. No response. No pulse either. Dive master says, abort dive safely. Dive ended without any more casualties. Dive master, so shaken up by death, insists he has to retrieve the body right away. Goes alone. As he descends to cave entrance, he feels his lips start to tingle. Suddenly, his eyes roll back and has a convulsion spits out regulator, supplying his air, and drowns. Turns out, the first diver died from oxygen poisoning. He filled his own tank up, and did not check the O2 levels in his nitrox blend, giving himself like a 75% mixture. The cave was way too deep for that kind of mix. The dive master was killed because he did not wait long enough for the nitrogen levels in his blood to settle, and died in a seizure. And that is why you always dive with a buddy and always have an O2 sensor to check your nitrox mix. Be me on spring break in Panama City with friends. Half drunk, staggering up the beach at like 1am. Spot two of those big water tricycles getting washed out to sea. Rescue. Eh, hey, we save these things, they owe us a ride. Out on the ocean on big trucks, goofing off and laughing while we pedal toward our hotel. Don't notice the current taking us out. Next thing we know, can't even see the beach, just the glow from the lights. Start piddling like crazy toward the lights. Cloudy, so no moon. Dark as hell. Start losing sight of each other. Shout to other track. Pedal toward us and ons. Can finally see them clearly again, coming toward us. All of a sudden, they both start screaming, and their track just laterals about 20 feet in an instant. They're all like, what the hell? What the hell? What was that? Water glowing softly from stirred up plankton. Hear a ton of splashes all around us. Realize that it's a school of fish jumping. Something hammers our track, spinning us around. Everybody is freaking the hell out. Hear what sound like a truck's air brake being released. Something rises up from under us. Track literally rolling down the slope of its back. Track tips over. Me and friend fighting each other to get it turned back upright, finally coordinate and get it done, pull ourselves back up on track, well gone now, keep pedaling till we finally get back to shore, trembling like scared little kids. First story, went on a deep wreck dive, 250, 
current so strong, we had to hang on to anchor line, like our lives literally depends on it. On ascent, novice panicked and kicked my mask and regulator clean off my face. I know we barely started the ascent. I am 200 below, and there is no way I can swim up. Frantically search for my regulators. Can't reach them due to current pulling it straight away from my hands. Look up with no mask. Seriously think about risking it and just shoot up. Thought I was going to die. My training kicks in. Left hand automatically felt my back up wreck. Found my mask. Ascend up safely. The novice is a dumb bitch. Didn't tell her what she did. Just keep quiet. Second story. Ocean kayaking to a small uninhabited island. About two hour paddle. Got super tired. Stopped to enjoy the beautiful open ocean all around me. Suddenly feel the urge to look down. Realize I stopped at a part where the coral reaches to just a few feet below the surface. I observed the coral. Lots of nooks and crannies. Gave me the chills. Put on my reef shoes and dare myself to get off the kayak and to stand on them. Not sure if I did or did not. The sight of the corals rising from the deep ocean to just under my kayak creeps me out to this day. Third and final one. Eleven years old. Went nighttime deep sea fishing with my dad and his buddies. My line caught something heavy. We decided to pull it in. Close to the boat, we shine a flashlight to it. It's a rock corals full of fish swimming around it. I pulled up Nemo's home. The sight of our flashlight lighting up a creepy coral in dark water really imprints in my young mind. I scuba dive, but yet each time I was terrified as hell. It doesn't matter if I dive in a lake or open water. 60 or 150, I never feel at ease. I was an avid diver for 7 years, and later did free diving, which is safer and less creepy. I swear, unless I have to, I never go diving again. Neither will I train my friends or family to do it. Ocean is very creepy. My instinct tells me to stay far, far away. I have one you guys might like. There is this middle-aged guy that's kind of famous around here. He used to be a pretty popular local celebrity surfer, and damn near every day if he went down to the beach, he would be out on the water. Surfing was pretty much the guy's life. At some point, he just stopped surfing completely, out of nowhere too. I hear that at the time, there was even some possibility of him going pro. But the guy stopped surfing entirely after he had been rushed to the hospital one morning. Now the rest of this is just what I've heard and it's starting to turn into an urban legend already for something that happened in the past decade. But the people I've heard it from swear up and down this is the story that someone managed to weasel out of the guy one night. Anyway, the guy got rushed to the ER because his fingers are gone. Like, all of them. Just totally gone. They look like they have been bitten off, and he is in no condition to talk when they rush him in. He is a surfer, so the initial assumption by the doctors is that he had a shark attack. It's kind of unlikely though, because when it happened, it wasn't really the season for sharks to be roaming in the waters nearby, and there had not been a report of a shark in the regional waters for a good long time. They take care of his wounds, but the guy is in bad shape. He had signs of sleep deprivation, some alcohol poisoning, his teeth were messed up, and every single one of his fingers were gone, down to the last digit. Guess I'll continue this in the next post. So they decide to run an x-ray on him, to see if there's anything else wrong with him, and he's still not in a good enough condition to talk and tell them what the hell happened to him. And this is where it gets weird. Outside of the previously mentioned stuff, there is really nothing wrong with him. They do find something in his stomach though. Bones. The guy apparently ate every single one of his own fingers off. This guy was popular around town, like I said. People knew him, and he had plenty of friends. He wasn't just some nut who would just up and decide, hmm, I think I'll eat my fingers today. Naturally, they ran some tests on him to see if he was messed up on meth or some other drug that would make him lose his mind and do that, because it is not unheard of for some druggies to do crazy stuff like that. Not a single drug in his system, outside of the alcohol, and even that was not bad enough to justify him doing that to himself. He wasn't totally blackout drunk, but it just seemed like the guy had been drinking rather than eating or drinking water. Eventually, he wakes up after a day, and the doctors got him to talk. He gives some kind of excuse, and makes up weird stories, 
so they just send him to get his head checked for however long and make sure he's not at risk for taking his own life. After a while, he was released, and since then, pretty much went around doing odd jobs, but stopped surfing or even hanging out at the beach. So this is where it goes from bizarre to really spooky. A guy is hanging out with him, and after a good bit of alcohol, gets him to spill what really happened. The surfer guy is pretty buzzed and starts talking about what happened. He says it was not a shark attack. He wasn't even in the water when it happened. It was after he had been out surfing for most of the morning and came back on the beach to chill out for a bit before going out to grab some lunch. He grabs his board and starts to make for the car, but out of nowhere feels this weight on his back. It wasn't a physical weight, but more like that feeling you get when someone is watching you. But the surfer said it hit him like a real weight. Like eyes weren't just watching him, but just boring into him. He looks over his shoulder, and there is a guy standing right behind him, maybe two feet away. The guy is dressed like a sailor, head to toe. The stereotypical kind. White pants, white shirt, with that weird mini cape on top of it. I forget what those are called. A white beret type hat with a tassel. From what the surfer described him outside of that, he was tall and lanky and had long black hair. Really weird thing, the guy was stressed with the sailor's hands. Apparently, he had beautiful hands, like something you'd see in a painting or classical sculpture. This sailor guy just starts talking about beaches being places of transition and how he doesn't like them. Kinda reminds me of what this anon was saying about the beaches. Sailor guy is going on and on about beaches being transitional areas, like they weren't quite belonging to the sea or belonging to the land. The beach was some kind of border that he hated to pass through. The sailor keeps going on about beaches being borders, and then says that surfers are the same thing. According to him, surfers are transient and don't belong. Around this time, the surfer got this really bad feeling that he just knew that the sailor was a murderer or some kind of psycho. Personally, I don't know why he didn't get out of there as soon as the guy snuck up on him. The sailor keeps ranting about surfers and beaches, and demands to know what the surfer considers himself. Is he a man of the land or a man of the sea? He gives examples, like the dentist doesn't leave land, so he's a man of the land, while a fisherman lives off the sea, so naturally he's a man of the sea. So what is a surfer? They go out to water, but return to land quickly enough. They don't stay out on the open ocean for weeks or months. Naturally, the surfer has no idea what he is talking about, and the sailor is getting agitated about it. He starts insulting him, saying indecision is a sign that you are not a man. He keeps demanding, are you a man of the sea or a man of the land? He keeps going into him about this, calling him indecisive and not a man. At some point, the sailor just grabs the guy's hands and tells him, if you want to prove you're a man, eat these, pointing to his fingers. The surfer gets out of there finally, but said that those words stuck in his head for nights. And yeah, I guess he just gave into the sailor's voice and ate his fingers. What kind of fucking ending is that? Oh, he just gave in. <laughs> he, he just ate them. <laughs> this, it was so good till that point. No one else has seen a sailor looking guy around town, though I have no idea what that's about. Was he just some kind of psycho? A weird sea ghost? What the hell, X? Shitty fucking story. Hey everyone. I am a little earlier than usual today. It's one of those lazy days, I guess. Ever heard of the Shag Harbor incident? If not, then here we go. It's not about a bizarre being or entity, but a strange, um, incident, as it were. And it has nothing to do with actual shagging, but aliens, possibly. Incident at Shag Harbor. On the night of October 4th, 1967, Numerous residents of Shag Harbor, a small fishing village on Nova Scotia's southeast coast, witnesses a multi-lighted craft which eventually appeared to crash into the sound. The sound is the western entrance to Shag Harbor proper. The unidentified flying object was observed drifting with the current on the sound by more than a dozen witnesses, including three RCMP officers. All of the witnesses, both in and around Shag Harbor, reported what they thought was an airplane crashing near Shag Harbor. The Free Mounties contacted local boat captains and the Rescue Coordination Center, RCC, in Halifax, and asked, 
the Mounties initiated a recovery operation, fully expecting to find bodies and wreckage out in the water. Initially, two fishing boats loaded with volunteers went out on the water and searched. They were eventually joined by others and Coast Guard Cutter 101. What is impressive is the amount of documentation of armed forces teletypes, principally the RCAF Zerdask in the nation's capital, Ottawa. The newspapers responded to the event, carrying stories about the event and one-inch headlines in Eastern Canada's largest conservative newspaper, the Chronicle Herald. For a short time, the Shag Harbor UFO incident became a worldwide story, and as case number 44 was left unsolved in the Condon report. The incident is in two components, the documented case and the subsequent anecdotal case supplied by retired military personnel from the Canadian Army, Air Force, and Navy. During the first two hours of the incident, Coast Guard Cutter 101 joined the search, but it also brought news from RCC Halifax. No airplanes were reported missing. This left the searchers and witnesses wondering, what had they seen that evening in the sky and floating on the waters off Shag Harbor? A mystery that has endured to this day. The Royal Canadian Air Force designated it as a UFO. It was a little after 11 p.m. on the night of October 4th, 1967, when an unknown object with four bright flashing lights in sequence and estimated at 60 feet in diameter was observed hovering over the ocean near the small fishing village of Shag Harbor, Nova Scotia. Several residents of the village first noticed a rather strange grouping of orange lights. Several eyewitness accounts indicate that there were four orange lights that evening. Five of these witnesses included a group of teenagers who watched these lights flash in sequence for several minutes, and then suddenly and rapidly dive in a sharp 45 degree angle toward the water's surface. To the amazement of the teens and other eyewitnesses, on hitting the water's surface, the lights did not immediately disappear beneath the gentle swells, but seemed to float on the surface, approximately one and a half mile from the shore. The initial panic reaction of the observers was that they were witnessing the emergency ditching or crash of an airplane. The first report phoned in to the RCMP, Royal Canadian Mounted Police, in Barrington, came from a young fisherman who told them that an airliner had gone into the bay. The first reaction by the police dispatcher was that the young man had been drinking. However, after an immediate rash of 10 additional calls reporting the incident, the police quickly recontacted the young fisherman for location details. Within the same time period, however, Constable Ron Pound of the RCMP was on patrol on Highway 3, heading towards Shag Harbor, and had been observing the strange lights as he increased his speed toward the incident. Constable Pound's report was that he believed that the four lights were coming from a single aircraft that he estimated to be about 60 feet long. As Constable Pound reached the shoreline, he was joined by two other officers, Police Corporal Victor and Constable Ron O'Brien. Additionally, several of the fishing village's residents stood on the shore watching and questioning what to do next. According to Constable Pound and the other officers, the orange lights slowly changed to yellow and the object appeared to move slowly across the surface of the water, leaving a yellowish foam in its wake. By this time, no fewer than 30 witnesses from various vantage points watched as the object slowly drifted further from the shore. All would later describe the object as about 60 feet long, 10 or so feet high, and dome-shaped. After about five minutes, the object started to sink beneath the icy North Atlantic waves. A few of the eyewitnesses reported hearing a whooshing noise. While the RCMP had already been in communication with the Canadian Coast Guard and Cutter 101 was on the way, two of the RCMP officers and a few local fishermen hurriedly launched their boats to speed to the rescue of any survivors. As the small boats and Cutter 101 reached the location, the lights were no longer visible, but they found themselves sailing through a thick yellow foam that indicated something had submerged. The fishermen report that the foam was not sea foam and looked nothing like they had ever seen. In fact, most were unnerved by the fact that they had to sail through it to look for survivors. After several hours of searching, nothing was found, and the search was called off at approximately 3 a.m. Both the NORAD and the Rescue Coordination Center in Halifax had been contacted by the RCMP and found that there had been no reports that evening of the missing aircraft, either civilian or military. On October 5th, the following day, 
the RCC filed a report with the Canadian Forces Headquarters in Ottawa. The report stated that something had crashed into the water in Shag Harbour, but that the object was of unknown origin. The Canadian Forces Headquarters dispatched the HMCS Grand Bay to the Shag Harbour crash site, and using advanced detection equipment and specially trained divers from the Navy and the RCMP, the Canadian military systematically searched the seafloor for several days and found nothing. Here in 1967, the mystery ended with no physical evidence ever recovered and no additional leads. For a few years, the story kicked around in the local papers. From time to time, various theories and intriguing rumors emerged about Russian spacecraft or Russian submarines and an American follow-up investigation. Then the story simply faded into obscurity. That is, until 1993, when the Shag Harbor incident once again was brought to the attention of the public. This was due to the dedicated, investigative efforts of two men, who are MUFO and investigators, Chris Stiles, assisted by Doug Ledger, using public records, such as newspaper clippings and police reports, were able to track down and interview many of the eyewitnesses and individuals involved in the Shag Harbor sighting, the rescue attempt, and in the subsequent investigation. Through their work, some extremely compelling clues and amazing new insights were uncovered. In interviews with divers and crew members from the HMCS Grand Bay, they discovered some startling information. The object that dove into the waters off of Shag Harbor had been tracked, and it had actually traveled underwater for a distance of about 25 miles to a place called Government Point. In the 1960s, the US had maintained a small but technically advanced military base at Government Point, managing a magnetic anomaly detection system, Mad Grid, for the purpose of detecting and tracking submarines in the North Atlantic. The US military had most definitely detected the object on its sensitive tracking equipment. Naval vessels were dispatched and positioned over the unidentified object where it had stopped. After three days of no movement and not knowing exactly what it was, the military was planning to initiate an investigative salvage operation. As the Navy waited and planned, the detection equipment picked up another object moving in, and to the amazement of all of those involved, joined the first object on the ocean floor. The speculation at the time was that the second UFO, I guess officially now an underwater flying object, was there to render aid to the first object. Not fully comprehending what they were dealing with, the Navy decided it was best to stand by and observe. For nearly a week, the Navy vessels held their position over the UFOs. The detection base, however, located a Russian submarine that had entered Canadian waters to the north, so several of the vessels had to be pulled off target to sail north to investigate. Under the cover of this new activity on the surface, both UFOs made their move, accelerating underwater toward the Gulf of Maine. The remaining Navy vessels pursued them toward the United States, but the objects continued to distance themselves from the trackers. To the astonishment of the pursuers, both of the objects broke to the surface and shot skyward to vanish within seconds. According to the researchers, while these observations were well corroborated by many credible eyewitnesses, these accounts were given off the record by military, ex-military, and civilian personnel who fear harassment, ridicule, or loss of pension. So as the saying goes, only the names have been changed to protect the innocent. Clearly, a series of very extraordinary and still unexplained UFO encounters involving the navies of two countries and NORAD occurred at Shag Harbor on October 4th, 1967, and in the following week in the deep waters off of the coast of Maine.